quite a morning. You are, awesome. you, are, you are our third NFL alum, and I'm so glad to have met you, to have the chance for you to share today. Um, I like to just, you know, have you take it and run with it, and then, you know, we can have organic conversation as we're moving, but um, share with us, you know, anything about your background or how you'd like to introduce yourself, and then you can just launch right in because you have some great content. So hello, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I hope you are having a wonderful day. And just to piggyback on what Lila said, the movement, your body, you know, the energy arrives before you do. I, I tell a lot of people that. And um, I think back to my days in high school of um, being a thespian instead of running track in my junior year. Can you imagine that? What an unbelievable opportunity for me because it taught me presence. It taught me how to be on stage. It taught me how to communicate and interact with others in a different way other than playing basketball or football or any of those types of things. So my experiences from high school taught me a lot. It allowed me to be in a leadership position. Uh, one of the other players was alluding to um, not, not um, having the training to become a leader. And because I'm an old person, we used to go outside and play and that's how it worked. And you got a chance to interact with the other uh, people in your neighborhood. And typically the older, the older people taught you how to do certain things. And then when it was your time, you learn how to do it yourself. So that's a gap that's missing now. And, and I've talked a, a lot about that with my colleagues. So I do realize I'm jumping all over the place. So let me just come that's back great. for a quick second. I'll just say, you know, I'm a former NFL athlete, played collegiate football at the University of Maryland. I was the first person from my immediate family to go to college and graduate, which was a great honor, especially when your grandmother was not able to read due to circumstances. So my my leading off with athlete really isn't, that's not my identity. I know who I am. I'm someone who did athletics really well. I was also someone who loved to read. I was also someone who was curious. You know, I had an imagination. I used my imagination. I did lots of different types of things. And that's the beauty to me of what high school and or school could be about for all students. It's a great place to practice in an environment. For me, it was safe mentally, physically, emotionally. And, and, I, and I do realize now in the space in which we live, you know, there's a big difference, but hopefully we can get back to that place to where it's safe emotionally, physically, mentally. I can't say spiritually, but we all know that's an important component of all those things. Um, so, so I understood who I was and, you know, I credit my parents. I also credit my faith. Um, uh, that was a big part of me, um, you know, so I'll just, I'll throw this out to you. I fasted right before going into my ninth grade high school year. And for me, it taught me focus, discipline, committing to something, despite not ever doing it before. And, and just, just with a beginner's mindset. And that's what you need when you play a sport. Um, sometimes we don't know how to do things, but that, that's, that's why it's important. Failure to me is the, failure to me is on the same side of, of the street as success, only success is further down the road. So you have to continue to go in order to get there. All of us at some point probably rode a bike. We probably started with training wheels. You probably fell off and you immediately hop back on and you fell off again and you hop back on. No one needed to go hey, try that again. You just did it automatically until you were able to stay on that bike without the training wheels. So anyway, long-winded introduction. I was hoping we, I, I was thinking this was gonna be you know, really interactive because we just had a great conversation when we first met and- Oh my um, gosh, and, and we can be interactive. And actually I do wanna interact for a moment because you talked about beginner's mindset and um, the Dean of the students at Columbia, he just retired. When he speaks to students when they come on campus, that is his speech. You are all here to be in beginner's mindset because some of you think you know everything and you do not, right? Like, you know, he's yeah. really big on that. 
And so I got to hear him speak several times when my son was there because I went to the family things, you know, I got to hear him. He was such a great speaker, but he would always go on beginner's mindset. So I love how you started with that because I think it's powerful. And we, we, when we're all, Leela and I talk about this, um, if we're in know-it-all mindset, we miss out. Absolutely. Absolutely. So to all be in beginner's mindset, we can all now learn from things. And so, um, so yeah, tell us, tell us a bit about like who you coach and how you work and, and any specific tips or tools you'd like to share today. So the beauty of who I get to coach, it ranges from those in the high school age group up to our age group or beyond. And I love that because it gives me the flexibility and it gives me the opportunity to work and see younger people who are just starting off, maybe thinking about, I don't know what I'm going to do. How am I going to do it? Versus the other end of the spectrum where they're like, oh my God, I can't stand doing this. And it's just interesting for me to be able to see and experience that all the time as a reminder. And that's, that's why I love it. Um, I think sometimes, especially those of us in the older age group, we lose track of what it was like when we were younger. We lose that beginner's mindset, so to speak. So a quick story, about five years ago, I um, was taking yoga for the primary reason of the movement, what Lila just talked about and loved it. And I would always ask questions. And someone said, one of the instructors was like, why don't you just take teacher training? I'm like, teacher training, what's teacher training? And they told me what it was. And I'm like, okay, I'll do it. So I became a certified yoga sculpt teacher and did it for four years. Now, when I signed up and I went to my first class, I was the oldest person in the room. I was the guy with the best tan, the best permanent tan. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would like that. And um, I like to make fun of race. So that's my way of making fun of those labels that we always adhere ourselves and I try to get yeah. away from. And what I realized as I was in that class and going through it, those were things that the stories I was telling myself. When I got outside of that, I was able to learn and grow with everyone else despite Sanskrit was not my first, second, third, or fourth language. It was a complete <laughs> new language. <laughs> but the, the beauty of it all was the other students were there to support me and help me. And that's the community aspect of things. And that's what we're missing right now in a society is we're not listening. We're not listening to be understood. We're listening just to be heard. And I'm trying to operate and model listening to understand where people are coming from okay. so i guess one of the tips i would say just just as an overall tip is we have two ears for a reason and one mouth try to keep this closed more and listen more but listen at the various levels to make sure you understand what's being said and and what that person is really trying to convey to you mm -hmm. yeah yeah um I do a lot about that because the stress response will actually prevent us from being able to listen. Yeah. And so like I, if I'm working with a parent and they say, you know, I'm so frustrated, I tell my kid to take the garbage out. They don't take the garbage out. I go, if they're a fight or flight, they didn't even hear you say it. And it exactly. didn't launch in their hippocampus. They're not, they're not resistant and pushing back. They actually didn't hear you. And so it's yeah. cool when you can really open that all up and you get to start to hear. So, so yeah, our hearing is so important and really listening is really powerful. I yeah, the that. other part to that is we, we have an, an intentional filter. So things are happening, unless it's prioritized in our, in our psyche, we aren't even aware of it. And um, Levinson, who wrote the book, The Unorganized Mind talks a lot about it. It's pretty heady, but essentially what it comes down to is What's important, and I just forgot the other one, but if you check out the book by Levinson, it's a great book. Um, it's, it's, it's really, it really becomes very clear that our minds are super fascinating. Obviously, for those of us in the older age group, because of neuroplasticity, we can still learn. Oh, yeah. But you have to believe you can do that, which is so important. And just to piggyback on what Lila said about the feeling piece, oh my God, that's so important so so important and and one of the exercises i used to do having when i played sports was before a game let's just say basketball you know before i played that game 
ahead of time. Of course, we practice as a team and individual, but I would see myself playing the game and how I would perform and then visualize all of that. And then the feeling of taking a shot and seeing the ball go through the basket and playing defense. But when you have that feeling and then you get out on the court playing that game, you've been there before, you've already done it. So it just puts you in such a place of preparation and, and practice, which is really what sports does very well, the repetitive nature of preparation and practice and game planning. Um, I think football, you know, of course, I'm a little, um, I, I favored football for, for particular reasons. One, because of the numbers, the sheer numbers and having everyone come together, it's a beautiful thing. The, the, the aspect about it is the coaching and the, and the community piece, because when you're competing against someone else that might be in your position, in some respects, they're helping you. They're helping you get better because the better they perform, the better you perform. And that rises, that raises the level of everyone on the team. So I, that's, that's why I love team sports. That's why I love football. Um, but like I said before, it was not my identity. It was just something I did really well. Yeah. When you and I were talking earlier um, last week, we, I really loved what you were doing at University of Maryland and with the career prep. And I would love to share that because Teg is going to speak um, after you. And I, I would love for you to share um, the challenges you found when you were putting that program together. Could you do that for us? Sure, sure. So, you know, I worked as a, uh, an associate athletic director in the position, um, you know, at the University of Maryland. So having played there, you know, it, it was an honor to be there, it was an honor to be a part of it. But more importantly, my experience as an athlete, like I was involved in other parts of campus. I got involved in, I was uh, chosen to be a part of the chancellor's advisory committee. And it was a pretty small committee, the chancellor and, and three or four other people from other parts of campus. So my way of being was being involved in every aspect of campus. Well, a lot of times when athletes get on campus, they stay pretty much in that own little bubble. And you think about it, I don't know, at most universities, there's what, 16 teams, 17 teams, depending on whatever their makeup is. So there's a, at most a thousand athletes, but typically under a thousand. So that's a really small percentage. And when you're only hanging out with that small percentage, I call that group think. <laughs> you tend to do only what they do. I didn't do that. That's not how I operated. So when I worked at the University of Maryland, you know, I, I affectionately called it life after sports. The biggest challenge is coaches. Coaches are the big challenge. And because I didn't have the authority or the power to mandate the student's attendance. And there were a couple of programs, you know, when you're putting on a career, a career fair specifically for athletes or an event specifically for their mental well-being or an event for sexual assault and rape prevention programming or something of that nature. In all my years, we only mandated, uh, we only, we only mandated one event that everyone had to attend, including coaches. And it was, it was in that realm of sexual assault and rape prevention programming. And um, I'm, of course, that's something that's near and dear to my heart because all of us know someone that's, that's been impacted by that. And, and um, I'm not gonna delve into that, but that's something near and dear to my heart because uh, I've had a student call me just two, three years ago and, and had to listen to that story and, and support that student. So the challenges are just sometimes it's, it's contrary because the coaches are trying to win. That's their primary job. The athletes are trying to win at that sport, but they also need to win at life and preparing themselves for life. And at that age, as we all know, their brain isn't fully developed. So they get pretty focused in on that one thing and they aren't expanding their minds. So that's where the mentors, that's where the coaches, that's where someone like myself would come in. But it was pretty frustrating um, not to have student athletes attend the functions like they should. And then of course, you know, four or five years later when they're transitioning, they, they're, they're like, oh my God, I, I wish I had done that. I wish, I wish, I wish. 
And that's something, obviously, that's, that's the beauty of, of, of age for us and experience is we put these things in place for you to benefit because we are hearing from others who wish they had done those things. So it's something that's even happening at the NFL level. I was, I was uh, in LA for a mental health certification course through the NFLPA and there are athletes who just um, been in the league five years and they aren't transitioning well. So that's, and it's not that the NFL doesn't have programs, they have it. It's the focus, it's, it's their mentors. It's a lot of things. And, um, and it, even if you think about someone like John Morant, I mean, like what, what's happening there, we of course don't know exactly, but it's sad. I've heard that story way too many times, way too many times, but it's a cry for help, um, you know, especially from the mental and the emotional aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and, you know, you're anyone who's trying to make a difference to like you were at University of Maryland, there's so like you mentioned the coach pushed back, but, you know, and then you like open th something up for for anybody, not just the athletes, and then well, you yeah. get back against that. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing is, like, I think my, um, I'm used to, I'm used to not necessarily fitting in per se. But I like that. I kind of relish in it. Like when you have a name like mine, you know, Azizuddin Abdurraouf, but that wasn't my birth name. So I'm used to just the flexibility, the agility. You know, even me being here, I was on the other side. I had to travel in the day early to go to someone's event here in Indianapolis. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm not going to be at my computer. And then I'm setting up and I'm trying to get into the waiting room. And I'm like, oh my God, the, the Wi Fi just went out. So, I, I, Lila, you know what I did? <laughs> deep breaths. I'm like, hey, let's figure this out. And that's what's really important. You know, you get out of that, that fight, flight, or freeze mentality and breathe and like, okay, I can solve this. And, you know, that, that's what coaching is. That's what mentors are for others. Um, you know, I, I, I wish Tag the best in what he's doing because it's hard. Because <laughs> you're dealing really with you when, you know, and I'm, I'll, I don't have a problem saying this because a lot of coaches are really individuals who haven't continued to develop themselves professionally to the best that will serve their students. Well, I, my husband and I would talk about people too, like we had a friend who was a superintendent of a school district. They'd never been out of school. Exactly. They had never been out of school. <laughs> Every, their entire life from kindergarten until they're 70 years old, they were always in school. And that's kind of interesting too, like understanding how much more there is in the world and, and, and that you're preparing students for the world, you know, so the worldview can get small. We would also talk about, you know, certain teachers, their worldview is so regional. It's like, we wanted our kids to have a worldview so we did so much at home to like open up that worldview and make that a real part of their lives. And, and it has to be intentional. We've that word intentional has been popping up a lot yeah. um, today. And, um, and so, yeah, powerful. So, you know, Elle, when I taught yoga, the first thing you do is you start with the intention. You set the intention for the class. So intention is, is clearly really important and when you do that you know even like what else said you um i'm sorry what uh, lila said when you prepare when you set yourself up for success that's intentional you know you get yourself into the routine that's going to be best for you whether it's moving your body a certain number of times a day um or how many times a day you're going to do it super important mm -hmm. absolutely yeah so do people have questions for sis while he's here I mean, he's just a, a wealth of information. So feel free to come on out and, and ask and he will definitely share. Can I make a comment? Yeah, absolutely. There's no question. Um, it is a pleasure to meet you here. Um, man, you talk my language, you're speaking my language um, in so many different ways. Um, the uh, When you were talking about, especially these coaches that you need to have a growth mindset. And I, it, it took me a while when I, when I got into the industry, I, I literally left from actually kind of skipped a, a good chunk of the coaching piece. I did an internship at Yale 
in the athletic department and it turned into a full-time job in athletic administration for eight years. And then I got into the interscholastic side. Um, but what I found was, yes, that, you, you know, especially too, I was a young administrator. Um, some people thought I might've been over my head at, at, an, at an early stage and, you know, dealing with 30 year veteran coaches, you know, they're winning championships. They're, you know, they're a little bit away from retirement and going to be put in a hall of fame. And, you know, what are you to, who are you to tell me? And I, it, it dawned on me, right. In terms of at, at that time, I probably wasn't even thinking of the terminology of growth mindset or even adult learner, but you know, the day you stop learning is it as a coach is the day you die. Right. And you die on the vine and then you're done. Yep. And, and I've never been afraid to have to utilize that concept as a conversation um, for my coaches to make sure that we're getting them professional development and more so not just the X's and O's, right? In high school down below, you know, people think I'm crazy. I want to find the best person for kids. I want to find the person that's going to be there for them. And I want to create a legacy program and longevity. So you want them to be able to, you know, so I might get like the best flavor of the month, like an all American out of college and everybody wants that guy or girl to, to be the coach. Well, that person's going to end up somewhere else. They're not going to be with me that much longer. I can find the right people to teach the X's and O's. I need someone <laughs> that needs how to connect with kids, connect with their heart and be there for them. And if you have that and you couple it with the technical aspects of it, and those people are willing to learn and open-minded to learn, it's easier to teach the technical side of the game than it is to teach this part of the game. Absolutely. Relationships are the key to life. And, and that's why I talked about the community. When you look at sports like lacrosse, football, any, any soccer, they have more than two, three, four, five people on the field at a time. And then the way you practice, it's super important to build the culture. And the culture isn't just the coach up here. It's also the players and how they interact with that coach, with the other players. And it's really important for the coach to set the tone and model it. They have to model it, which is really important. And that, that's what happens a lot of times. Just a quick aside, with parents, non-athletes, and, and students tell me this all the time, they look at their parents and they're like, well, my parents are hypocrites. They tell me not to do this and they do it. I'm like, yeah. And, and I, I, it, there's nothing I can say about that other than what you're seeing is correct. Why don't you talk to them about it? Have a conversation with them. And conversations to me are really important. They lead, the, they lead to really fruitful information and feedback. That's probably one of the points that I would also say. Athletes typically are used to receiving feedback. And sometimes they don't receive feedback well. And, and what I love about Dr. Carl Dweck's work in growth mindset is feedback is critical. It's important. It's an important piece of all of that. I know for me being, you know, I went from quarterback in high school to a receiver at the University of Maryland. I ran under 4-4 my first, what, first or second day at camp. And they were like, whoa, we need this young man to be on the field right away. Here was the problem with that. This wasn't ready. I had the physical talent, but my confidence wasn't where it needed to be in order to play. So here's the piece, Lila, you'll love this. When you continue to practice and then one day, and, and when you're practicing scout team, you're going up against the, the first team defense. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh, I can do this. I can feel this. And it felt great. And it clicked here. So it felt, I felt it before it clicked here. And once that happened, I was ready to go. And that's probably the, the, the point that I would not necessarily leave on, but if anyone else has any questions, but you know, definitely when you wake up in the morning, have a clear thought as to what it is you wanna accomplish, visualize it, and then get that feeling of what it's like to accomplish it. That moves into some things that Larissa shared just briefly too. I have something funny to share. So my kids were hockey players. And their football player, the football coach wanted my middle boy who was like over six tall. He was a, just a total perfect D1 body, right? So he's like, high school football coach wants, we want you to play football, even though he played in middle school, but that's it, you know? Brings him out his senior year. My kid's a hockey player, tight end, gets the ball. He doesn't run away from the other players. He checks them out of the way. He's running toward them and checking them 
out of the way to score, right? So after the game, the coach is coming to go, what is with your son? He's like going at them. I go, well, he's a hockey player. He's checking him out of the way. Like, this is what he knows. You guys didn't teach him what he needs to do. So naturally he's just going to check people out of the way. Yeah. It was hilarious. It was so much fun to watch. It was very fun. However, he got turf toe on artificial turf. He got turf toe and, and he was the number one cross country kid. So now he couldn't run. Oof. Ouch. It was bad. It was bad. He wanted well, to be the first six sport athlete at his school. He was actually going to triple in the spring. Like he was just a ridiculous kid, you know, but it was, it was not so good, but just that idea of like his intention, he knew he wanted to get that ball across the line. That's all he knows. That's the intention. And yeah. so he fell back on what he knew to make it happen. You know, it's other, the other thing you mentioned, like the injury and, you know, my Achilles popped my fourth year of playing football. And obviously, you know, back then, major, major injury is still a major injury, but the, the technology and, and, and the diagnostics of it all have really shifted and changed. So I was in a cast literally for, I don't know, three months. I didn't start running until six months later. So I had to relearn a lot of things. But the beauty of what it taught me was that commitment to retraining, the belief that you needed to have in order to get through that training. and and just, and, and I had the support, you know, I had, of course, the medical staff and the other coaches, but all of a sudden you, I wasn't a part of that community anymore. I had to take on a different role. And that's one of the other reasons why I transitioned very well. I understood the different roles, the different phases of life, where, where these types of things happen. And, and someone else who didn't play sports, you maybe think of it as like, all of a sudden you were a, a great you're a professional and now you have to manage other professionals and it's a completely different skill set yeah. or you know in life you 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 were married you get divorced or something else happens and you go through these different phases so transitioning in life is something that we all need to develop the agility the flexibility and the mindset to be able to to, to navigate those types of things and sometimes having a growth mindset or having that beginner's mindset of curiosity will help you get through those phases. Oh man, Leela has a question here. Ziz, when someone has multiple talents and skills like you, what recommendations do you have for them to apply them without feeling scattered or overwhelmed? You know what I do? So if I'm working with someone and you're, it, it's, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a great question. I typically, if I'm meeting, I'm working with someone, I meet people where they are. And, and sometimes I'm working with a young person. They've had no idea I play professional sports. They may have had no idea I even play collegiate sports because it's not, that's not what's important to them. I just arrive and I listen to where they are. So I would say my skill sets, the intersecting point is, is that human connection and, and applying communication skills to all of that. And of course, you all talked about this earlier about the nonverbal, being open to learning and what and receiving versus, you know, maybe talking too much. But it's, it's um, I think in the world in which we live today, having multiple skills allows you to do different types of things. And I look for that thread and that weaves in between all of those things. And the thread for me is people and relationships. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. Yeah. I mean, and, and when a door closes, another can open. I was injured in high school and the opening for me, I, I couldn't leave the team. We had 26 distance girls alone. I said, can I help? So I apprentice coached. That put me in a whole different thing. And then I couldn't run when I went to Michigan. I got recruited to row. What a cool sport. Yeah. And then I made the varsity boat in three weeks. Like suddenly my whole life changed. Like I couldn't have planned that. I couldn't have figured that out but I didn't let my injuries stop me from being open and exploring and saying yes to things, you know, but yeah. sometimes people have injuries to take them out. I've, I've seen it over and over. And, um, and that's where our coaching can really be of help is when someone is in the pit, they're, they're injured, something's not happening. They feel st stuck. And Lila says great insight. So, well, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. And it's such a great lead in. 
I didn't even plan to have take follow you, but we have two ADs, you know, former <laughs> ADs like following each other. I think it's fantastic. And um, I'm just really, really, really grateful for you giving us this time, sis. It's very great. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. And nice meeting you all. All right. We will stop this one. <laughs>